In this lecture, we'll go from looking at the outer elements of sustainability, solar energy, eco-cities, and organic agriculture, to the inner elements of sustainability, spirituality, holistic health, well-being, and the good life. Sustainability is about connection, how sustainable systems for energy, food, water, and buildings relate. In sustainable systems design, resilience emerges from the number of connections between elements, not the number of elements in the system. We've seen how everything is connected in space and time by the great cycles of air and water movement on the Earth, driven by the sun. But there is a deeper level of connection. If you look at the writings of the early leaders of the sustainability movement, they often talk about an underlying unity that is at the root of the surface diversity of the universe. Here's a quote from Masanobu Fukuoka, author of One Straw Revolution. One thing is all things. To resolve one matter, one must resolve all matters. Changing one thing changes all things. And here's one from Ralph Waldo Emerson, often considered to be the founder of the conservation movement, a precursor to the modern environmental and sustainability movements. Every particular in nature, a leaf, a drop, a crystal, a moment of time is related to the whole and partakes of the perfection of the whole. Houston Smith, one of the founders of the field of religious studies, saw that the world's wisdom traditions were linked by what he called perennial philosophy. Smith suggests that a common element of the world's religions is the understanding that the divergent outer aspects of life emerge from and are connected at a common source, which he and the writer Aldous Huxley called the divine ground. Others call it being, source, or pure consciousness. Smith found that another experience common across cultures is the direct experience of this underlying unity at the core of human consciousness, sometimes in the beauty of nature, sometimes during prayer, and sometimes during meditation. The perennialists go a step further and say that connecting with this source is the highest purpose of human life. Many of our ecological problems can be seen as a disconnect, disconnect of people with the land, people seeing themselves as separate from nature, disconnect from the larger society, disconnect from a sense of purpose and meaning. Huxley, Smith, and the other perennialists suggest that the primary cause of all these disconnects is a disconnect with our own inner nature being. Here's Emerson again. The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited with himself. Huxley goes on to suggest that humans can heal the outer disconnects by direct experience of this underlying inner unity and, this, and that this experience results in a fuller and richer life. Deep sustainability explicitly recognizes a core unity of nature that is at the heart of the surface diversity of life. Sustainability is the intellectual understanding and practical application of the interconnectedness of human and nature. That's one way of looking at it. But the direct experience of this interconnectedness complements the intellectual understanding of it, and it leads to more holistic understanding of sustainability. How can we reconnect with something deeper than our surface life, the wholeness that underlies the surface? Well, some people do it through religion, some people do it by direct experience of nature, and some people do it with formal techniques of meditation. Whatever its form, I think some way of directly experiencing being is an essential part of a sustainability worldview. It's at the heart of creating a sense of purpose and meaning. The perennialists argue that people need this spiritual connection like they need air, water, and food. The unsustainable world around us is a direct result of a worldview where the experience of being is missing. For myself, having that connection to being through daily meditation is the single most meaningful and useful thing I do. I began meditation as a way to help me cope with college life as an undergraduate and because I read a book called Cosmic Consciousness by Richard Buck. 20 minutes of meditation was promoted as being as restful as several hours of deep sleep, so I figured if I meditated, I could stay up and party longer. This, there was a transcendental meditation center that I passed by on the way to the university every day. There had been a lot of scientific research done on TM indicating that transcendental meditation has a wide range of holistic benefits, so I decided to give it a try. I've since learned that not all meditations are the same. They use different procedures and have different effects. 
The meditation I do is a simple mental technique that allows the body and mind to naturally settle down to a state of deep rest. I meditate in the morning for 20 minutes before I start out in the world, and I meditate, and meditate 20 minutes in the afternoon before dinner. My days are hectic and filled with activity related to my work as co-director of my academic department, teaching and sustainability consulting work. I particularly enjoy my afternoon meditation as it allows me to reset before spending time with family and friends, or in a lot of cases, another round of work. The less important things dissipate and the more important things are seen in a fresh light. Even though I don't specifically think about solving problems during meditation, as my mind settles down and experiences deeper levels of awareness, I often have flashes of insight into problems I'm working on. Meditating film director David Lynch calls this diving deep to catch the big fish. Outside of meditation, I'm more relaxed and better able to meet the challenges of my busy life. There's a broad body of studies that confirm a wide range of benefits for this simple meditation practice. In a Scientific American article published in 1973, Keith Wallace argues that the state of restful alertness brought on by TM is a fourth state of consciousness distinct from waking, sleeping, or dreaming. It is characterized by awareness without an object of perception. It's as if you had been watching a movie, and all of a sudden the movie stops and you see the screen the movie has been projected on. Over time, you begin to experience more clearly the underlying unity of consciousness that is at the source of your thoughts. And with continued practice, you begin to experience that same unity in the outside objects of perception. It's not so much an intellectual understanding as a direct perception. You can experience the unity of nature through intellectual understanding or observation on the outside. And you can also experience the unity of nature by going inside as well. It seems like a paradox until you have the experience of it, but this inner unity is the source of outer diversity. Well, what does all this have to do with sustainability? As I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, sustainability is the intellectual exploration and practical application of the many ways in which nature and humans are interrelated. And this interrelation has its core in the underlying unity of nature. The meditation I practice I do, Transcendental Meditation, is not a religion. People of all faiths practice TM, as well as people who are agnostic. But what do faith-based organizations have to say about sustainability? Let's explore that next. There are many flavors of all the world's major religions. One thing religious communities have in common is that most are interpreting their own ancient traditions and practices to encourage environmental awareness, sustainability, and the relation of humans to nature. The group Interfaith Moral Action on Climate, IMAC, includes, includes leaders from Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, the Sikh religion, the Islam religion, Native Americans, and more. Their mission statement reads, virtually all the world's religions and spiritual traditions proclaim that we have a moral obligation to be good stewards of the earth and all its creatures and processes. To disrupt the climate that is the cornerstone of all life and to squander the extraordinary abundance of life, diversity, and beauty of the planet is a moral failure of the first order. Many of the religious and spiritual practices of indigenous people, including modern ones like the Native American church, are explicitly grounded in an ethic of care of the earth and sustainability. Here's a quote from Black Elk. The first piece, which is the most important, is that which comes within the souls of people when they realize their relationship, their oneness, with the universe and all its powers. And that this center is really everywhere. It is within each of us. This is the real peace, and the others are but reflections of this. This is from The Sacred Pipe, published in 1953. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops states, care for the earth is not just an Earth Day slogan. It's a requirement of our faith. This environmental challenge has fundamental moral and ethical dimensions that cannot be ignored. In Cedar Rapids, Iowa, not far from where I live, there is a group of Franciscan nuns that operate an environmental and spiritual retreat center called Prairie Woods. It uses a wide variety of sustainable technologies, including passive solar building design, straw bale construction, solar hot water, and organic food production. For many years, they had the largest solar array in the state of Iowa and have hosted a wide range of environmental events, including the annual Iowa Renewable Energy Expo. 
In the U.S., the Christian tenet of stewardship is seen in a concern for the environment and sustainability. Many work to educate against excessive consumerism. Churches operate a lot of buildings and vehicles. By implementing energy efficiency strategies, they can use the money saved to further their spiritual and environmental missions. Christian communities all over the U.S. are centers for organizing environmental initiatives, including energy efficiency, solar energy installations, and conservation and stewardship initiatives. Interfaith Power and Light works with congregations nationwide on energy efficiency and renewable energy policy initiatives. Many churches are centers for community gardening. A church near where I used to live in Hawaii sponsored a large community garden in the city of Pahoa. In Islam, core environmental concepts include a belief that all things in the world are related to each other, that balance in nature must be maintained or restored, and the fruits of the earth may be enjoyed, but its resources must not be wastefully exploited. Judaism has a wide range of green organizations, including the Green Zionist Movement. Jews observe an annual New Year of the Trees holiday with tree planting and other ecological efforts and celebrate by eating grapes, figs, pomegranates, dates, olives, and the grains of wheat and barley. Religion often explicitly refers to the interconnectedness of things, as we discussed earlier. The inter and as we discussed earlier, the interconnectedness of things is at the heart of sustainability. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., in a speech given for Christmas 1967, says this about religion, sustainability, and the interconnectedness of things. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied together into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, you've depended on more than half the world. This is the way our universe is structured. This is its interrelated quality. We aren't going to have peace on earth until we recognize the basic fact of the interrelated structure of all reality. And this is from King's 1967 Christmas Sermon on Peace. So let's talk a little bit about um, health and wellness and a more holistic approach to medicine. I'm the co-director of the Sustainable Living Program at Maharishi University of Management. A few years after we started the program, I noticed that many students double major in sustainable living and physiology and health. They recognize that the health of the individual and the sustainability of the planet are intimately linked. Many of the same processes that compromise the health of the planet also contribute to an epidemic of diseases like obesity and diabetes. Just as sustainability has given us more holistic approaches to how we provision ourselves with food, water, housing, and energy, new approaches to medicine are taking a more holistic look at human health and well-being. Some of these approaches, like Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, which is from India, are based on traditional medical systems. These approaches, even though they're called alternative in the West, have been in continuous use by large numbers of people for thousands of years. Some approaches, like chiropractic medicine, are newly developed. Conventional medicine has remarkable successes. Deaths and trauma injuries, infectious diseases, childhood mortality, and many other afflictions have all dropped dramatically due to modern medical advances. But wealthy Western countries with extensive modern medical systems have seen an increase in diseases that have been stubbornly resistant to treatment, like heart disease, obesity, and cancer. These diseases are aggravated by the lifestyle demanded by the industrial economy, widespread use of toxic chemicals, and the foods delivered by industrial agriculture. John de Graff calls the ills that continue to plague wealthy countries affluenza in a book he wrote with the environmental scientist David Wan and economist Thomas Naylor. The full title of the book is Affluenza, the All-Consuming Epidemic. It's also been made into a film. There is an old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Holistic medicine focuses on preventative practices, using measures like nutrition, diet, and lifestyle for prevention and treatment of disease. Holistic medicine looks to take maximum advantage of the body's natural healing responses. Here are a few approaches and strategies used in the holistic health movement. Ayurveda is a holistic system of healthcare that starts with analysis of your particular body-mind type and imbalances. 
Your body mind type is then used as the basis for recommendations on diet, daily routine, herbal supplements, behavior, and exercise. Ayurveda is the traditional medical system of in India and has been in use for thousands of years. Aromatherapy uses fragrant natural plant oils for the purpose of altering one's mood or improving physical and psychological well-being. For example, some people find the scent of lavender to be very relaxing and soothing. The deep rest offered by regular practice of meditation helps keep stresses of everyday life from accumulating. Stretching exercises like yoga and breathing exercises called pranayama are often used in conjunction with meditation. There are many approaches to diet and nutrition within the holistic health movement. Some common elements include eating fresh, lightly processed food grown without chemicals. Michael Pollan, in his book, In Defense of Food, offers this common sense advice. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Other holistic approaches include exercise, herbal and nutritional supplements, homeopathy, chiropractic medicine, and massage. Next, let's explore the relationships between work, leisure, quality of life, and sustainability. The industrial economy promised fewer working hours for higher wages, but the reality today is that most Americans are working longer hours. Wages for many have stayed stagnant for decades or gone down. It doesn't have to be this way. There are many countries that are opting for a shorter work week, including France and Germany at 35 hours uh, per week each. These countries have found that worker productivity per hour rises with fewer hours worked. In 1930, in the throes of the Great Depression, serial magnate W.K. Kellogg decided to conduct an experiment. He replaced the three daily eight-hour shifts at his plant in Battle Creek, Michigan, with four six-hour shifts. Employees worked 30 hours under the new system in contrast to 40 hours under the old. The results? The company hired hundreds of new people. Production costs plummeted, and employees operated more efficiently, learning to prioritize leisure over work. Productivity was so high that Kellogg was able to pay roughly the same wage for the 30-hour week as was paid for the 40-hour week. And vestiges of this system remained in place until 1985. My wife is from France, and the French have a well-deserved reputation for seeing more to life than work, for putting the workday in its proper place. I've learned a lot about the possibilities for a different pace of life from my wife and from visits to France. Outside of the big cities, everyone still takes two hours for lunch. In France, businesses and government offices are closed at lunch. The only thing you can do is hang out with your friends and eat lunch. And many people get subsidies from the company they work at to buy lunch at a cafe. People get six weeks paid holidays, even if they have a low-level job or work for an American company. Most take it in August when the weather is nice and all their friends are on vacation. For this reason, lots of restaurants, businesses, and shops in Paris are closed for August. There's also a lot of concern about food. People talk a lot about it, including how to best grow it for flavor. Even people who have never been on a farm have an opinion about the best way to grow something. I once heard someone selling cheese at a farmer's market argue that the Conte cheese he was selling had a special quality due to the time of year. The cows were eating grass that had frozen in the morning, which he claimed had a positive effect on the flavor of the cheese. The French look for special qualities that come from a particular region or method of growing. They put an official government stamp on the best of these, called an AOC, Appellation d'Origine Controle. The best known are for wine and cheese, but the AOC stamp also applies to lavender, chestnuts, olive, pastured poultry, and much more. I once asked a 10-year-old kid where the best chickens come from, and he immediately replied, poulet de Brest, chicken from Brest, an AOC where farmers are well known for growing free-range chickens. The Appalachian de Origin Controle is much more than a marketing gimmick. It defines an authentic product and its methods of production. For example, the rules that define Roquefort cheese include requirements that the milk must come from sheep within a limited area around Roquefort. The milk must be raw, and the cheese must be produced, processed, and aged in Roquefort. The French recognize the tremendous impact that one area, one environment, the weather, the water, the soil, has on a product. It's called terroir. This is not arbitrary snobism, but a recognition that food is being produced within the abundant flows of nature we've talked about before. These rules also specify methods of sustainable production. 
All these rules guarantee that Roquefort remains a unique product of the region and not just a marketing scheme. That doesn't mean Roquefort is a small business, however. Three million cheeses, about 18,800 tons, were made in 2005. It employs 4,500 people on 2,100 farms. It's worth about $300 million at the retail level. Contrast this with American Viticultural Areas, or ABAs. The Upper Mississippi River Valley ABA includes Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. If you've traveled through these states, you know that there is little in common with growing grapes and making wine at one end of the ABA and the other. The ABA designations are simply a useful designation for marketing a wine from a broad region, little more. They say nothing about sustainability. In France, fridges are smaller, people shop more often and eat fresher food. In the block or two around my mother-in-law's house in Paris in the 11th arrondissement, there are several shops that sell really fantastic cheeses in four or five great bakeries. They are not seen as elite, and people of every socioeconomic status frequent them. At the end of her street, there's a farmer's market, run by the city, at least twice a week. Cafe life is alive and well, and people spend a lot of time with friends at cafes and restaurants. They rarely invite friends home. Their apartments are small, and they value the privacy of home. Plus, if you all go out, no one has to clean up. These social and cultural aspects of a good life are not as seen as something that is elite, only for the upper classes. Efforts are made to see that everyone can participate in what is good in life. The French feel that people have a basic right to pleasure. Even when engaged in satisfying work, a balanced life means time for friends, the arts, culture, and civic engagement. The slow food movement is an approach to sustainable living with the philosophy that sustainability increases pleasure and sensuality in life. The organized versions of it, including slow money and slow cities, have come out of the slow food movement. The slow movement is an organization opposed to the commodification and industrialization of life. More than just opposition, it also offers a positive alternative. In Italian, Carlo Petrini and a group of activists started Slow Food in the 1980s with the initial aim of defending regional traditions, good food, gastronomic pleasure, and a slow pace of life. The movement has evolved to embrace a comprehensive approach to food and life that recognizes the strong connections between plate, planet, people, politics, and culture. Today, Slow Food represents a global movement involving thousands of projects and millions of people in over 160 countries. Slow Food even has a university, the University of Gastronomic Sciences, founded in Bra, Italy in 2004 by Petrini. In 2008, Petrini was named one of the 50 people who could save the planet by the British newspaper, The Guardian. In the US, slow food is sometimes confused with an elite approach to gastronomy that involves eating only the most expensive and rare of foods, indifferent to where the food comes from and the social and economic conditions of the farmer. In contrast, here is Petrini's definition of eco-gastronomy, which I repeat from an earlier lecture. I like to know the history of a food and of the place that it comes from. I like to imagine the hands of the people who grew it, transported it, processed it, and cooked it before it was served to me. I do not want the food I consume to deprive others in the world of food. I like traditional farmers, the relationships they have with the earth, and the way they appreciate what is good. The good belongs to everyone. Pleasure belongs to everyone, for it is human nature. One of the advantages of my work with sustainability is that I sometimes get to meet my heroes. Here's a picture of me with Carlo Petrini at Slow Food Nation, a national slow food celebration held in San Francisco in 2008. 50,000 people attended. Does the slow food philosophy of buying fresh and local always cost more? Well, let me tell you a story about how we dramatically increase the amount of local food in the university dining service where I work. Although the main purpose of the project wasn't saving money, we ended up saving thousands of dollars per month over the extra overhead by buying locally. Many local farmers grow to standards that meet or exceed the national organic standards, but can't call their produce organic because they do not want to pay for or go through their effort of certification. Some are Amish farmers that, who feel that organic cert certification involves too much red tape. Our goal in the project was, be was to begin to develop long-term relationships with farmers we trust and that trust us. We developed a standard we called Fair Food. 
We had 20 or so farmers that participate in a local Amish produce auction fill out a questionnaire about their farming practices. About 15 of the 20 met our standards for ecological farming practices and care of the land. We had further conversations with these farmers and began buying their produce. An Iowa State University study found that the average bite of food travels 1,500 miles from farm to fork. In contrast, we recently had a meal where 98% of the ingredients were sourced within 100 miles of the university. It included cabbage, grapes, several varieties of heirloom tomatoes and peppers, cucumbers, yellow summer squash, dairy products, zucchini squash, basil and other herbs, sweet potatoes, kale, chard, black beans, green beans, and the exotic kusha squash. Many weeks, my university dining service is 50% locally grown. We've saved about $3,500 per month on the cost of food for the cafeteria after subtracting the cost for a local foods coordinator who continues to develop relationships with farmers. Carl, Carl Honoré, in his book In Praise of Slow, gives exa examples showing most areas of life can be improved by the slow philosophy. The slow philosophy is not about doing everything at a snail's pace. It's a cultural revolution against the notion that faster is always better. It's about seeking to do everything at the right speed, savoring the hours and minutes rather than just counting them. Doing everything as well as possible instead of as fast as possible. It's about quality over quantity in everything from work to food to parenting. Honoré realized that things needed to change when he found himself contemplating the purchase of a book, One Minute Bedtime Stories, looking to cut precious time spent with his children at the end of the day. Slow Money, founded by Woody Tash and described in his book by the same name, is a kind of patient green capitalism that looks to connect investors with projects that don't fit into conventional finance. Most projects are related to farms or building capacity in local food economies. Securities laws that make it easy to invest in a shopping mall halfway around the world make it almost impossible to invest in smaller local projects. Slow Money is working to change that with local investment clubs and other ways to connect local money with local entrepreneurs and nonprofits needing cash. The Maine-based No Small Potatoes Investment Club has generously agreed to put all of its agreements and research on legal structures for local investing online. Check out their website if you'd like to find out the details of how local investment clubs can work. Although it's not often seen in this light, I think slow food, with its emphasis on a better way of life, has the potential to be one of the most powerful sustainability and environmental organizations in the world. So far in this course, we've been discussing the outer aspects of sustainability. Earlier, we discussed how everything in the world is connected on the outside, how sustainable approaches to food, energy, water, and building are interrelated how the economic, social, and environmental elements of sustainability are related. Sustainability is the intellectual exploration and practical application of this connectedness. In this lecture, we've changed our approach and explored connectedness from inside to outside. We looked at some inner dimensions of sustainability, sustainability in spirituality, sustainability in holistic health, and moving away from an industrial era mindset with a slow food movement. In addition to the theoretical and practical aspects of connectedness, there is an experiential element. Humans can directly experience the essential oneness of nature through spirituality and through observation in nature. You can even make it part of your daily routine with meditation. Sustainability is about creating a fundamentally better and more satisfying quality of life.